Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Alex Tausig. I'm a partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners in Silicon Valley. Uh, for those of you today who aren't familiar with our firm, uh, we're a global venture firm with offices in the US, Europe, India, Israel, China, uh, and more. We manage over 10 billion in committed capital, invest from the very beginning stages of technology startups all the way through the IPO. And I spend most of my time focused on marketplace businesses, hence why we're here today. And uh, in the US and abroad, um, I also co-lead our practice in uh, Latin America. Um, I'm thrilled today to be joined by Jeff Collison, uh, COO and co-founder of FAIR. Jeff's had a spectacular career in tech. After spending a few years at McKinsey out of college, he joined Square in 2011 on the business intelligence team. He later ran teams at Square across biz dev, ops, marketing, and partnerships before heading over to Opendoor, uh, where he ran growth for several years. Uh, Fair, uh, Jeff then went to start FAIR with his co-founders, Marcelo, uh, Daniele, and Max. And I've had the privilege of working with Jeff and his team since uh, Lightspeed led FAIR's Series B round in 2018. So we're going to speak today about FAIR's journey from working with a handful of small retailers in the U.S. to building a truly global network for local commerce. And uh, so to kick things off, I wanted uh, Jeff to just give a little bit of a thumbnail on FAIR itself for those of you who aren't familiar. You know, what is FAIR? What do you guys do? And why is it such a huge opportunity? Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, and excited to be here. So thanks, everybody uh, who's attending. Um, yeah, so maybe I can give the quick overview on kind of FAIR and, and our customers and, and the mission associated with it. FAIR, like Alex mentioned, is an online wholesale marketplace that connects brands and retailers. So on one side, you have brands, and these are folks who make products. It could be anything from home decor goods to apparel to bath and beauty, um, pet goods, specialty food, kind of anyone who, who makes the products for consumers. And on the other side, you have retailers. And this might be an offline retailer who has you know, one, two, or three locations in, in any city or town um, across Europe or North America. It might be an online retailer. Increasingly, it's kind of both, somebody who, who straddles online and offline. And brands in FAIR connects them with, with our online marketplace. And brands come to FAIR primarily for distribution, you know, access to, I think, 350,000 retailers now around the world. And you know, previously, it was really difficult, basically impossible to get that kind of scale of distribution if you are a brand. And on the other side, retailers come to us for a few value props. Um, first, they come to us for, for data-driven product selection. Um, so we recommend products for them that, that we know are going to sell in their store. Uh, we also guarantee those products will sell in their store. So we offer free returns. If, if a product doesn't sell in a retailer store, they can actually return it back to FAIR. And we couple that with net 60 terms, which means you don't have to pay for 60 days as a retailer. Um, and functionally, that means you don't have to pay until after you've sold the product. Um, and increasingly, we offer free shipping as well to our retailers. And so one way you can think about those value props that, that we offer, particularly on the retailer side, is stuff that the big folks have always had. And now we're trying to give it to independent retailer and smaller brands. So, you know, if you were, I have some very American examples. If you were Nordstrom's uh, in America, or I guess Marks and Spencer's over here in, in London, I'm in London right now. You know, you've always had lots of really smart, probably MBAs telling you what products you should buy. We want to give that same kind of data-driven uh, recommendation and engine to smaller retailers. Big retailers, you know, whether it's Amazon or, or offline retailers have always been able to get terms from banks. They've always been able to push product that doesn't sell back to suppliers. Um, they've probably always been able to get free shipping or, or subsidized shipping. And we want to give those same kind of tools and benefits to small retailers um, and brands to let them compete. And so a lot of our kind of mission and vision is how do we take all the small retailers, all the small brands around the world, give them a technology platform and really allow them to be competitive and thrive uh, in an environment, in a retail environment going forward. Yeah, that's that, that, that's great, and I, I wanted to dig into that a, a little bit more because you know, it, it, going as an investor, going back a decade, you know, I've seen a number of people before you and I met um, who had tried to aggregate brands and sell to retailers in, in a more digitized way, and none of them really uh, amounted to building a, a marketplace. Can, can you can you go back to sort of the beginnings of Fair and some of the insights that you guys had around how you were going to do it differently, what you looked at in the past, and what hadn't worked, and maybe some of your insights from working at companies like Square um, into, into like what you formed into sort of the key insight that, that allowed you to build a real marketplace here. Yeah, I think, you know, our experience began at Square. Like you mentioned, that's, that's where I worked before. Fair, my co-founders as well. And I think there were a couple of, of, of experiences we had there that were informative. Um, 
you know, we were spending our weeks building products for small businesses. I think we really got an education in how you can leverage technology to help small businesses um, really build, build their companies, build their businesses and thrive. And we saw kind of the ability to manipulate data and technology to do that. And um, I think Square was one of the first people to really do that at, at scale. And that was obviously a really big business. Um, but at the same time, you know, my co-founder, Max, actually ran an umbrella company um, that you're very familiar with. So he was spending his weekends at trade shows trying to get his umbrella distribution, um, whether it was in big retailers or small retailers. And one of the first things actually hit Square was run the trade show team. Um, so I probably went to 50 to 100 trade shows in, in my second and third year at Square. And I think we were both, um, along with Marcel and Daniele, kind of struck by the juxtaposition of using technology to build awesome tools for small businesses during the week, and then kind of getting exposed to this industry that felt very underpenetrated by technology um, that was really holding back some of the, the small retailers and brands as a consequence of that. And, you know, I don't think candidly, a, a lot of people had built, you know, from retailers to consumers or from brands to consumers, which made sense because I think you tend to extend entrepreneurial energy where you have experience and lots of people are consumers. And so I think the the lens into the, the wholesale space came through that experience. And, you know, like you mentioned, you know, we're not geniuses. We weren't the first people to wander around a trade show and, and think well, like so, this. So, some of you, some of you are. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely there's at least a couple there. of geniuses in the company. Um, wander, you know, I don't think we we're the first people to experience the wholesale industry, wander around um, a trade show and think, you know, there's elements of this that feel crazy. Um, this feels really under untouched by a technology that's helping small businesses in lots of other ways. But I think, you know, as you alluded to, just taking a trade show and moving it online hadn't been successful historically. Um, I think it had maybe helped solve some of the brand pain points and mm -hmm. it was kind of a no brainer on the brand side. But for retailers, you know, a lot of the challenge for a retailer, whether you're an online retailer or an offline retailer is, you know, the risk of taking on a new product is really scary. You probably have thin margins already. Maximizing the gross profit per square foot of your store is critical. And if you take on a whole bunch of new inventory that doesn't sell, that you know can be devastating for your business. And if I take a trade show or you know similar element and just put it online, now as a retailer, I don't know if the product I'm going to get is the same. I haven't been able to connect with that brand. And so I think you know part of of the insight and, and part of the motivation was how do we de-risk the equation for the retailer? And in some ways, it was it was a risk problem at its core. And I think we had a risk background at Square. Um, you know, the founding team, whether it was Danielle and Marcel, have worked in risk and in, in, um, data science before. And so what we did, I think, and, and the insight was, okay, let's take the data that's available about brands and retailers now and, and the information in general about the wholesale and small business space that maybe wasn't available a decade ago. And can we use that to create value props um, and just value period for retailers that helps make it easier for them to move online? And I think you see that manifested in free returns and net 60 payment terms which are not easy value props to fund and to develop for retailers, but kind of fundamentally changed the experience for retailers because now they could move online, they could try new products without the anxiety of not knowing if they were gonna sell because we were gonna kind of guarantee that for them. Um, and I think that was kind of one of the, the big things that, that helped the market move online and unlock it. And maybe wouldn't have been possible without both kind of a data expertise and maybe some of the availability of information and kind of advances that didn't exist 10 or, or 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's so interesting because as an investor, I, I obviously have a different, I have a more of a 30,000 foot view of all of this. And, and the thing that I've just noticed is the path you guys took was so dependent upon where you came from, you know, and what you really were familiar with. And you took a totally different approach than some other startups that had come before. I, I remember Max saying to me um, early on that this is really a risk problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we are able to aggregate the data in this market, we will be able to help all these entrepreneurs manage their risk better as a centralized repository of that data. And that really impressed me as a level of insight. Um, and it's really it's really played out. I mean, the, the progress that you guys have made with regards to the quality of matching is just incredible. Um, and especially as the assortment has grown. Yeah. And I think like to your point, there were you were never in this category. I think there were investors who thought, you know, free returns are net 60 maybe would never work or, or how do you do it at scale? And I think for us, it's about aggregating that data, but also then turning it into real value for retailers and brands. Um, and how do you make it so you can give them value props and experiences that allow them to be with bigger folks who, by the way, have always had this data, have always had this. It's about creating a, a platform for smaller folks to get to. Yeah, we had also been coming at that moment in time from off the heels of our investment in a firm. 
and we had we had seen what it meant to build a high quality underwriting organization, and we really liked how you guys and, and Daniele specifically viewed this as an underwriting problem, and we were underwriting risk essentially as we're taking on this net sixty terms thing, and then we're managing that risk down and creating value for everyone in the ecosystem. So it was just I think <clears throat> now in retrospect it looks like it all works, and we'll get to you know what what success looks like, but at the time I think it was a a very unique approach to building a marketplace and one that like I think is maybe applicable in other industries and, and and we're starting to see that now um can you can you just talk about the, the sort of this this side of the journey you know we we I, you guys obviously announced today that you raised a new round at at a, a 12 billion dollar valuation um and so things seem to be going well <laughs> um <laughs> can you uh can you just talk about like the scale of the business now um some of the the, goal, the global operations of the business the categories all the different things that you guys are doing so people get a sense of the sort of scope of fairs business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe one other point that, that you hit on, I think that the data piece is critical. And I think the other part of the, the background and the experience at Square is kind of understanding small businesses and how to build software them because it is a data problem and recommendations are critical. Building a great shopping experience is too, because retailers also, they know at the end of the day what's best for their store. And I think having the kind of art and science um, marriage has been really critical for the retailer experience. Um, and to your question, you know, we've, we've been live, it's 2021, we've been live a little over four years now, um, probably started working on the, on the business a little over five years ago. And like, yeah, we've, we've obviously the, the value props have resonated on both sides. I think we have about um, 350,000 retailers on the platform now across North America, um, you know, tens of thousands of those in, in Europe now as well. And, and I think a little over, or a good amount over now, 40,000 brands on the platform. So um a good amount of kind of scale on both sides, which I think has been really helpful for some of the challenges we talked about before. And that's kind of across, you know, most verticals that you would expect. It's roughly a reflection of the kind of share of, of different categories across, you know, home decor, apparel, food, pet, um, that you would kind of see in, in retail in general. Yeah. It's hard to put those kind of numbers into perspective for those who have to spend time in retail, but that that number of 350,000 is significantly larger than by a number of doors than the largest retailers in the US and yeah. I'm guessing glo globally um it's just incredible what the aggregate of all these individual small retailers create in terms of a market demand yeah i mean um, they're, they're they're bigger than any retail in the world if you can get them all together and i just think they haven't had a platform to unify them in a way that kind of gives them the leverage that, that they should have yeah. So we talked a little bit about SMB and, um, you know, the challenges of building SMB businesses. Obviously, you guys came out of um, came out of Square, which which did, which did a very had a very successful run. It still is a very successful run as both an SMB and now a consumer uh, company uh, as well. But with with SMB, the challenge is typically customer acquisition is just really, really difficult. You know, small businesses don't have a lot of revenue to give you. So doing the things that you do in other B2B businesses like direct sales tend not to work. Um, can you talk a little bit about the journey to figuring out growth and customer acquisition at FAIR, um, how, how you've married sort of like the value prop for the retailer with some of the referral loops that have kind of created the growth story that you've seen uh, through today? Yeah, I think you, you mentioned probably the first question you asked lots of folks building in the SMB space is great. You know, how are you going to acquire so many SMBs or aggregate them? Because it's very hard. Uh, and I think... It, even five years ago, it was hard, but I think a lot of folks have proven the story that if you have a really compelling product, there are ways to do it. And you know, there's hundred billions of dollars of, of companies worth now that have been built in the SMB space, Square being a great example of one. And I think, you know, probably pretty well documented. One of the, the things that Square did that I think was was very clever was you know, every time somebody interacted with a Square reader, it was basically a marketing impression. Um, both the branding of the device itself was super intentional as well as the experience that you went through and even the receipt um, mm. very much designed with that in mind and, and how do we think about that kind of moment being really delightful and impressionable and so many SMBs obviously are consumers as well that that kind of crossover particularly in a low-cost channel can be a no-cost channel essentially can be really effective um, so I think Square kind of had a really unique way of cracking it and probably most companies that get to scale in the SMB space have have kind of one of these one or two fun hacks mm -hmm. um, for us, I think I think as you as you reference, you know, we've had a lot of our growth powered by both kind of organic and then referral traffic, and I think the reason that referral loops are hard, and I think they're they 
most really successful ones, people think like you just did it once and it exploded. In uh-huh. reality, you have to like really tinker with them and getting the incentives right on both sides and all the different hooks and loops into it and how it's positioned and where does the experience and where in the funnel and um, how you can as much friction as possible. I think for us, part of what's powered our ability to grow by referrals is, you know, there's, and, and what I mean by referrals um, is, you know, brands invite retailers over to the platform and they say, hey, you know, I already work with this retailer or I've wanted to work with this retailer and now I can send them my fair link and it's super easy for them to order from me. And then they obviously go on to order from other brands on the platform. Um, and then brand retailers also say, hey, here's some brands that I either work with or think would be a great fit for fair. And I'm going to refer them over to fair um, for your sales team to close or I'll help you close them. And we kind of incentivize that on both sides of the marketplace. And I think, you know, part of the reason it's worked for us in, in some of the discovery is lots of marketplaces have different types of, of network effects and they kick in at different points in scale. And I think for us, the network effects are, are, are really there kind of all sizes. It, it really is a better platform for brands when there's more retailers because they're going to get more orders. And it's a better platform for retailers when there are more brands because they have more selection. They can run more of their entire inventory through FAIR. It's a simpler process for them. Um, they save kind of time and money on the back end. Um, so I think that that's one reason it's worked really well. I think the other is, you know, the incentives that we have on both sides we've tinkered with and I think have gotten to a pretty good place, both in them being compelling for retailers and then being sustainable for us. I think it's all about kind of finding that balance of incentive that gets you the right behavior from the referee and the referral and also obviously sustainable for you. And then, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think, I think a lot of people look at referral and they say, they say, man, that would be great. And I see this in a lot of consumer companies that aren't marketplaces and they, they can never end up, they never end up growing referral beyond 10 to 15% of their uh, user acquisition for you guys. It's been over a majority for, for a long time. And I think what the, what the insight is like the product has to be really, really strong to actually get the referral, you know, going and it has to be actually selfishly like incentivized for each party to, to, to do it. You know, you can't push a referral loop up a hill uh, just by putting money behind it. And that, that seems to always be something that was clear to me about fair was it like the use case for having your other people you do business with on the platform was so obvious, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think you have a ceiling if it's, not kind of um, natural to the marketplace. Yeah. Like it's kind of like, oh, I'm going to refer you to buy this sweater and here's some money off. Like that's a little bit of value for you, but it, it's more transactional and there's not really any benefit to me outside of maybe a, a small financial benefit or benefit to you. So I, I think it, the, more, the more it's a natural action as part of the marketplace and then the more you can kind of layer incentives that are just amplifying that versus yeah. kind of creating the behavior. It's like, I'm probably not going to recommend you to like buy a sweater from this company. So this is a new behavior for me that I'm now trying to be incented to do versus it's highly likely I was actually going to see the benefit to you being unfair or some, you know, square cash as an example. And now I'm just amplifying that behavior and maybe steering it in certain directions as well versus trying to create out of thin air. Yeah. Well, this, this has been uh, given a shot of adrenaline even more once you guys started to go international this year. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the learnings from expanding into Europe, you, you know, FAIR launched, I think, 15 countries in the first six months of the year, launching more now. Um, so just incredibly fast pace of expansion. Um, maybe just talk about a little bit of the how the, these cross-border network effects between brands and retailers played into that expansion. And just in general, what have you learned from rapidly expanding across all these different countries? It's just in, in such a short period of time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, we wanted to go international because we felt like it was the right answer for our customers. I think first and foremost, we like fundamentally believe that a global marketplace is more powerful. And, you know, for the first time ever, a brand in Italy can order from a retailer or can get an order from a retailer in Utah, and we can simplify the cross border, the taxes, the shipping, all these things that kind of make that frictionless in a way that it wasn't before. And so I think we had a hypothesis that there was a lot of value here for customers and that was our, our primary motivation. And like you mentioned, that there was cross-border, you know, cross-border network effects is a fancy term that basically means, you know, is the demand and the supply in Europe, for example, going to interact with the demand and the supply in the U.S. in a way that maybe allows us to jumpstart the market from zero to one easier than if we were starting over. And you know, there's lots of businesses and even marketplaces where it's basically just a mini marketplace in every country. There's not a lot of overlap, and you're kind of starting over. And maybe you've got some learnings and some interesting insights from the data that that help you a little bit but you're kind of basically starting the business over. I think for us, we definitely had an hypothesis that, you know, we can start onboarding brands in Europe and they can get orders from retailers in North America. And that'll be a great experience for both. And then we can kind of layer on 
the retailer side. And then we also have the brands in the US for them to order from. Um, and I think we, we've, we've seen that play out. Like you mentioned, we're live in, you know, 14 or 15 of the biggest countries in Europe, so probably most of Europe by an addressable market perspective, and, and really we're able to jumpstart the market in a meaningful way because of that kind of cross-border demand and supply that we saw. I think the latest numbers were maybe doing like 150 or a little more, a bit more in, in run rate volume, which is, you know, took the US business two and a half years to get there. So I think when, when you can do it in, you know, six to eight months, it's definitely leveraging some of, of the size and, and the network effects that we have. And, um, I think it's been it's been pretty remarkable to see, and I think of it as jumpstarting the market. It's not how you kind of long term can serve the community the best. We need to you know build the experience to make it really great locally. Um, we need to have enough kind of supply and demand locally to, to to serve the community. But it's a good way to really jumpstart it. I think it's helped us get out of the gate really fast in Europe. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about some of the learnings from just doing this so quickly? You know, taking the operational model that you've applied in the U.S. and sort of like transforming it into different context. It might be sort of interesting to some other founders as they just think about operating a business that has to expand quickly across you know different country lines. Yeah, I mean this will sound trite, but I do think it's true, which is team is everything, um, and figuring out you know how who focuses on it domestically to get it off the ground. And I think it's very hard to make you know specifically international expansion, probably you know product expansion or category expansion, equally challenging, successful without you know. An executive founders, you know, almost full focus for some period of time. It's just too difficult. Um, and the team that you hire locally, I would say, is the other critical thing. You, you can, if you get the team right, you can get a whole lot else wrong. And if you get the team wrong, it doesn't really matter what else you get right. Particularly when there are, you know, eight time zones over um, during COVID, you can't necessarily travel and meet folks, or you can do so less frequently. So I'd say just the importance of team. Everyone says it; they say it for a reason because it turns out it's, it's true. Um, and I think we've gotten really lucky on that front. I would say the other thing that has been maybe a positive surprise, and I can talk about a challenge, is just the similarity of, of customers. Um, a brand in you know Bordeaux, France, it turns out has a lot of the same motivations and values as one in you know Boston or Birmingham over in the U.S. And they're looking for distribution. They're looking for retailers or customers that kind of resonate with their values and, and what they're trying to accomplish. And I think the fact that regardless of location, kind of you know small or local is is local. Um, and, and kind of small and independent retail, I think look and, looks and feels uh, very similar. And so our value props kind of naturally resonated and a lot of our positioning and language did. I'd say on the challenging side, you know, localizing and making your product resonate across cultures and languages is just really hard. And I think striking the right balance between, we've learned a bunch of stuff, let's not try to reinvent the wheel, but we don't wanna be arrogant uh, about what's gonna work in these places. And we need to hire local talent to build those experiences because at the end of the day, it needs to feel local and resonate locally. And you want to have the space to allow for that, I think has been something we've you know, learned and been a challenge and hopefully we're getting better at. I think we still have uh, a ways to go and making the experience feel great everywhere. But I would say that's that's been kind of the learning and challenge that I think we kind of knew intellectually going in, but it looks and feels pretty different once you actually get on the ground, once you hire folks to kind of own those things locally, once you get feedback from customers. Um, I would say that's... Um, yeah kind of been, been one of the learnings for us. Got it. I'm, I'm starting to get a few questions in from the audience. So I figured I'd, I'd intersperse those in since we only have a few minutes left. Um, you know, one interesting one was just around uh, from uh, Atiyah Sabur. I hope I got your name right. Um, how do you uh, sort of balance supply and demand across the marketplace? Um, and and to what degree does pricing kind of play into that on both sides of the, of the equation? Yeah, I think... Marketplaces are all different. I think it's really important to have kind of health checks and metrics and kind of know what matters on both sides of the marketplace and specifically know what matters to kind of create the outcomes of happy customers that are doing the types of things that you want happy customers to do on your platform. And so especially just scaling, having kind of careful eyes and a deep understanding of, of your business to know when those things get out of whack, because they will get out of whack at various points. And it's just a matter of like kind of constantly calibrating them. Um, I think referrals can be great on that, obviously, because they kind of keep it a little bit naturally in, in balance when the demand's coming from the supply and the supply's coming from the demand. On the pricing side, um, I would say maybe the, the only strong opinion I have here that I think is shared by lots of various folks is, you know, don't be afraid to price your product. And I think when, when you price your product to the ability that folks are willing to pay, it, it, it allows you to also then create value elsewhere. So, you know, having enough of, a commission or, or whatever feels right in the marketplace 
it's not, don't necessarily race to the bottom because the more margin you have, kind of the more room you have then to create value elsewhere, if that makes sense. You yeah. can fund value props for maybe even back to the person who's paying, maybe to the other side of the marketplace. It gives you more wiggle room to kind of pull levers when you have margin to play with. And I think if you start too low, you have kind of a window where you can go up. So don't get me wrong, but if you kind of start low and stay low and then it's kind of too late or you've trained the market, um, I think that can be difficult. I, I, I think it's a really interesting question in marketplaces specifically because, you know, we talk all the time, you know, around the boardroom about like trading, you know, some margin for, for increased growth. And the reason we do that is not just because growth is good, it's because when you grow, you have more assortment and you can serve more people. And like the product inherently gets better as you grow. And so there's always this question of like trading margin for growth, but you can't do that unless you're starting with good, you know, solid pricing. Yeah. Um, and so I think that philosophically, I, I, I'm very aligned with that. I, I think, I think also, you know, the supply and demand question is is a little bit easier when you're in a referral driven business because um, I think Max, uh, Max and I were talking about this once, and I, I don't know who said it, but it, one of us said it's almost like it's like a governor on the system, like a mechanical governor. It kind of keeps yeah. you in balance if that's a big part of your of your growth engine. And so that I think obviously you still have to do stuff actively, but just by nurture that referral loop, you're going to be in, in, in more balance than someone who didn't have it. Yeah. And pricing, like it's hard to raise prices. It's hard to maybe go for more than you think. And you're always going to get kind of like negative feedback about it. And you really just have to like actually go for it and understand how cust like customers react first, maybe the initial feedback too. We were going to talk about uh, COVID stuff. <laughs> uh, considering coming with, I don't know if we want to like, like get into sort of like the weeds of like the the difficulties and everything, but I mean maybe we can just talk about more of the upside of, of this transition that we've seen. Um, obviously, COVID was very difficult for any business that requires you to walk into an establishment at the beginning, but now we're in this world where wholesale e-commerce is just accelerated, and I think what a lot of people don't realize is that the supply chain transformation got pulled along with that. What, 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 is, and obviously there's, we're in a world of supply chain disruption right now, but what does that look like inside of FAIR? Like, what is your lens on the acceleration of this digitization of supply chain from, from, from your perspective? Yeah, there's obviously more details around, I think, what the COVID journey for us looked like, because it was, I would not say always um, easy. It was a bit of a roller coaster, but I think ended up, our customers ended up doing really well. And I think we saw communities rally around them. We saw them hustle, adjust their short men, I think even adopt kind of digital tools and online tools, at least the ones that were primarily offline in a way that they would have over the next decade and it kind of accelerated that. Um, so at our last minute here, I think on the macro level, to your point, the pandemic in many ways kind of, I think, accelerated trends that were already happening in terms of things shifting from um, offline to online. And I think wholesale had predominantly existed offline and was slowly moving online and their where you know, retailers and brands were adopting those tools, they were being empowered, they were seeing value in it. And I think you know, the pandemic really accelerated that. I don't think that's necessarily something that if you're listening to our board meeting 18 months ago, we, we would have seen coming um, or scenario that we necessarily game planned out, out of the gate. But I think that as the pandemic evolved, we saw that trend emerging. We saw our retailers and brands do all right um, and kind of be able to weather the storm and even maybe looking for lower cost, um, more efficient ways to, to source goods and, and tools for the store. It's been, it's been, it's been amazing to watch you guys weather the storm um, and really do right for your customers. Um, and, and really, uh, these are all small businesses. They employ tons of people globally, and they're really the bedrock of the communities they serve. And it's, 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 uh, I, what I remember is you guys first asking, how can we help our customers? And I think from that came all the goodness that we, that we see today. So, um, it's been a really incredible, you know, journey that you've all been on, and I've been fortunate to be, you know, a sort of a, a visitor in in that journey. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of lessons I think for other marketplace entrepreneurs, and hopefully, many of them are in the audience and they got a lot out of this. So um, I think we have to I think we have to go now. But thanks for thanks Jeff for the time today. Yeah. And thanks to the hosts for for having us. Thanks Alex. Thanks everybody. All right. Take care.